Here's a good rule of thumb when it comes to your health. Natural is better. In other words, if you can get your body to naturally be healthier, that's the best option. All right, what's the second best option? Well, if you have to use products to help yourself out, use those that help encourage natural processes. Those that try to mimic natural processes. Synthetic tends to be worse than natural. So if you follow those two strategies, you're probably gonna be better off. I wanted to do that because, um, well, there's a couple reasons why. One, uh, natural's always better, right? So naturally good hormone levels are better than hormones that have to be uh, you know, taken exogenously, obviously. Mm -hmm. If you're left with no other option, then what you wanna do is you wanna mimic natural levels as best as you can. That's the second best option. Diet, same thing. <laughs> things you put on your skin, same thing. You know, if you put things on your skin that don't work with your skin's natural way of being healthy, then you're probably worse off than working with things that encourage or work with your skin's natural ways of being healthy. Usually that's a great rule of thumb. And I think if people kind of followed this as their guideline, they'd be much better off. It's just, it just tends to be true most of the time. So I wanted to ask you that. So Caldera just came out with a new beer product and I was reading the label on it and I saw seed oils in mm -hmm. it. There's all this stuff going around right now with seed oils just being so bad for you. Is there a difference in me digesting it versus yes. me putting it on my skin? Okay. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah there is. So there I mean, is the skin is the largest organ of the body. Yeah. So. Yes. Uh, but um, so a lot of companies will use like synthetic uh, products, um, compounds to mimic what is natural. Uh, natural products, those derived off of plants and oils, are typically going to be better. Of course, the formulation matters but typically better because they're going to more mimic the oils in your skin that you naturally produce, balance out your pH. They're not going to wipe out or severely disrupt your skin's uh, microbiome or what's considered a healthy microbiome. Whereas the synthetic products generally tend to do that. Of course, there's always, you know, you want to look at the product itself, but the controversy around seed oils has to do with consuming them, not putting them uh, on your skin. Now, yes, putting things on your skin it definitely can affect your insides, but like mm. uh, seed oils or natural oils or plants, they're not going to have the estrogenic effects like the xenoestrogens may have. At the very least, you know, we've co-evolved with things that occur in nature. So we're more likely to understand what they will do and what they won't do versus let's say a new chemical that, oh my God, this is so good for yeah. you. We don't have thousands of years of co-evolution uh, with those things. That doesn't necessarily mean it's bad, but we just don't know. And when you don't know, you, I think going on the side of natural tends to point us in a better So direction. I think that's what a lot of people think when they ingest some of these seed oils, right? So I'm, Doug's got pulled up the Caldera Lab website. And I was like, you look at the you know apricot oil, the uh, gooseberry seed oil, red raspberry. You have all these things that are like natural yes, and that you, that are mixed up to make this blend that feels amazing on my beard. It makes it look shiny. Right. But then you have this stuff going around of like the different types of seed oils that people are cooking with and ingesting. Totally different. How is that? Okay, so yeah, how is that different? So those are, those are different seeds, by the way, that they're yeah. using in those seed oils. Those industrial seed oils are made from um, things that are not in the caldera be uh, you know beard oil for example um you know some of the stuff you mentioned you could literally take that take one of those seeds squeeze off, it and yeah get off oil. the off the plant yeah you're not like going through this industrial process to extract oil yeah, the you ultra have to, processing process you have to deodorize yeah. it and use other chemicals yeah. to strip it so that it doesn't smell bad or, so do you think that that's not sorry to interrupt you but yeah. i want to make a point if that's true do you think that is most likely, whether whether we know for sure or not, that these seed oils are very harmful, right? Because that the, the verdict isn't completely out. I feel like there's right. a camp of people that like think it's the worst thing ever. And then there's the other camp that like the Lane Nortons who are like, well, the, the, what the studies say, it's not clear yet. So do you think what we are seeing is kind of like what we learned about GMO stuff? It's more about what they're spraying or the process yeah. of it than it is actually the seed oils itself. So it's like the seed oils the chemical are- Chemical residue from the treatments. Well, just, just, the, just the whole process. Like, okay, so uh, look at it this way. And again, this isn't conclusive, but it is generally a good direction, right? Because we don't have data to conclusively show. There's some that shows it's bad, some that shows it's okay. 
we don't have conclusive data. So we have to go off of, okay, well, what's a good estimate? What's a good guess? And a good guess and estimate is not, um, well, data, we don't have the data yet. Therefore, uh, it's okay. That's right. not, to me, that's not a good direction because we didn't have data on a lot of things that we now know are bad for us. So what's a good, what's a good strategy? A good strategy is, uh, is this something that humans could have consumed in those quantities without the industrial processing processes? And the answer mm -hmm. is no. Mm -hmm. There's no way you would consume grapeseed oil uh, or rapeseed oil, as they call it, in those in the in the 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 amounts that we can consume them without these crazy industrial processes. It just doesn't. It just there's. It's impossible. So it's a good kind of rule of thumb to be like, okay, well, we don't know. So I'm going to go with like olive oil because you get squeeze in olive. I'm going to go with avocado oil because it's yeah. right there. I don't have to go through this super advanced process to pull this oil out. And, you know, we, we never consume this. It's just a good rule of thumb. Now, will it get proven one way or the other over time? I, I believe so. But so far, what seems to be true for the most part is the further away we move from the natural. how we evolved, yeah. Yeah. The, the more problems we it encounter. It seems like scientists, I mean, I, I get it. Like you're trying to just completely go by data and, and um, all these studies that are going to kind of give you one direction or the other, but it usually takes five to 10 years to reveal that. So in that, in the meantime, like you're telling the consumer that, yeah, well, based on what we have right now, everything is fine. And, it, you know, in, in that regard, as a consumer, I don't know that I want to follow the, that kind of a strategy. It doesn't seem like uh, a lot of the cases that have been out there for, um, you, you know, whatever it, it's uh, artificial sugar, whether it's, you know, some of these other controversial uh, type of foods that you're ingesting. Like, I'm I'm not going to take that chance as a consumer uh, going forward uh, on my own health. It's like, right. why? It's why on things where you, there's other alternatives. Yeah. There's a healthy, natural alter alternative. Yeah, we know that to be the case already. So it's like, it's like I'm taking a chance in look, this direction based off of whatever data you're presenting. Look, me. even things that seem to be innocuous, like, oh, um, we can live in temperature controlled rooms and houses and we have electric lights. Like, that's amazing. We should do that, right? That moved us away from how we evolved. Now it's got its own benefits. I'd rather live in a temperature controlled house with electric lights and live in a cave, okay? Mm -hmm. But are there side effects that we couldn't possibly or didn't even you know predict? Yeah, like our body's ability to adjust to temperature. Well, it seems like that's a muscle. If you don't strengthen it, you actually weaken the body. This is why hot, cold contrast therapy has got health benefits. What about electric lights? Our sleep is definitely disrupted because our brains evolved with the sun rising and then the sun setting. And so... You're, because of that, your circadian rhythm is in tu attuned to that environment. We moved into an artificial environment. Our primitive bodies, because our bodies are, are essentially the same as they were 100,000 years ago. There's no difference um, or even longer. Uh, it, it, we have some side effects. So what about food? Well, it's a good thing that we have food accessible to us all the time. It's a good thing that we've created foods that have a long shelf life, right? Are there side effects of that? Yeah, obesity. You know, obesity becoming a big one. Um, Hyper-processed food, that that's becomes another problem. So um, it's just a good rule of thumb. Why do you think the, it's so point. difficult for people to frame that like that? Because like, why does the, it become so the scientific, dogmatic yeah. and camps? It's it's either you, you so believe it or you don't believe it versus like, well, why can't you just have more of approach of like, for example, and, and by the way, I don't, uh, like I don't look at those things and demonize it. Like I, I'm, I've openly talked about uh, drinking diet coke, but I'm also mindful of like how unnatural it is, and that it's totally. probably not ideal. Totally, I do it all the time, and yeah. so I'm mind. So I'm just not like willy nilly drinking ten of them a day because yeah. I like them that much. Yeah. It's an yeah. occasional treat for you, is how you, you perceive it, right? right. And not I and I don't look at it like oh because it's diet and zero calories. This is healthy for me. I look at it as like ah, this is pretty far from natural. So if I really like this, I should probably minimize the amount I do it because it's probably not ideal for me. Whether that's been proven to be true or not, I, I don't understand why that is such a big deal to like frame it it's like just that. A, it's just a really good rule of thumb. You always got to weigh things out. I, I brought up uh, like hormone replacement, right? So if you're a man with really low testosterone, can't get it up naturally, it's not working, then you go on hormone replacement. It's better than being low testosterone, but is it better than having naturally good levels of testosterone? No. 
because it doesn't perfectly mimic the natural way your body produces testosterone, which are like spurts throughout the day. If you take testosterone, you typically will do like an injection. It gets a high peak after day one and it kind of slowly goes down over time and stays relatively high. The body doesn't naturally produce testosterone that, that way. So yeah. is it better if you compared people on testosterone therapy to people who are healthy with good, healthy levels of testosterone and all things being controlled, I guarantee you the natural testosterone is going to outperform it in terms of longevity. But if you compare low testosterone to, you know, testosterone that is artificially in a better place with exogenous, then you're going to see it's better. So if your options are to starve uh, or not get adequate nutrients or eat things with some seed oils, yep. then yeah, you got a better option. But if your option is seed oils versus olive oil or butter uh, or avocado oil, then it's, it's probably, it's probably better because those seed oils require crazy amounts of processing with advanced techniques that didn't exist up until, I don't know, what, 50 years yeah. ago, 60 years ago? If your minimal requirements for surviving is covered, you know, now we got to look at quality. Yeah. You know, it's, just, it's, it's not that crazy of a thought to go through this, like, uh, logic. Today's giveaway oh. is the RGB bundle. Here's how you can win that. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comments section. Now, we're also running a sale this month on some workout programs. Maps Bands is half off, and the Hard Gainer Bundle is half off. They're both 50% off. If you're interested in either one or both of them, just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. You know, I completely shifted the way I looked at supplements like midway through my career too because of the point you're making right now. Like, I remember when I was like the kid who was trying every like, you know, testosterone booster, you yeah. know, explode, like all these performance supplements to build more, you know, muscle mass stuff to build more muscle. Yet I'm super deficient in vitamin D yeah. or my B vitamins are off or like I'm not getting enough iron or it's like you're far better off looking at where you're potentially deficient in nutrients that are important to your body to run optimally and balancing that out than you are taking some perform the latest cutting performance supplement that's out there. And the irony of that and the reason why I know it's not pushed very hard is because it's cheap. Yeah. Yeah. It's not very expensive to go pick some vitamin D up, you know what I'm saying, or some B vitamins. You're you're the, it, there's more money to sell you on the the newest no explode there's creatine also, branch chain amino ma mass builder. There's you know, also blend. the there's science, which science the scientific method is objective. It's a wonderful process, one of the greatest discoveries of uh, of of humanity. It allows us to to innovate and test things objectively. Like it's amazing. But then there's also like the culture of the scientific community or people in science, people, of course, imperfect or like yeah. scientism, right? Like a right. religion around it where it's like, well, if the data doesn't show that it's bad, then it's not bad mm -hmm. or show me the data, show me the data, you know, type of deal. It's like, okay, we're not always going to have data, yeah. we, but we can use logic. Uh, and this goes in both directions. Like I, I remember talking about the supplement ashwagandha. Ashwagandha had been used for hundreds or thousands of years for libido, vitality, stress relief, okay? But there was no data to support it. So you'd bring up ashwagandha and the science community would be like, well, there's no data. It doesn't do anything. Well, well, it's been used for thousands of years for this thing. Maybe we should listen to people who've been using it for thousands of years. There's probably some value. Now we have data showing it's got, it provides all those benefits. So now they're on board. You brought up Caldera. If you look at, Cal here's, here's why I think Caldera is so damn effective. Like one bottle of their, their serum, Okay. Yeah. Works exceptionally well on Justin and on me. You yeah, couldn't have two weird. you couldn't have two different skin types. Yeah. yeah. He's dry, his skin is dry, yeah. mine is oily. I obviously darker complected, he's much lighter complected. Our skin is very different. With synthetic products, you would have a product for dry skin, one for oily skin. You'd have all these processes, all these chemicals to do that, whatever. Caldera, it's the same formula. What does Caldera do? Yeah. It uses natural compounds that more closely match and mimic your skin's natural way of being healthy. It works with your skin. So someone with dry skin, it works. And with oily skin, it works as well. I think that's a, now it's a rule of thumb, but it's not like a hard set rule. Yes, there's natural things that are bad for you and things that are synthetic that are better for you. But generally speaking, when you have this question in mind, 
should I put this on my skin? You look at the ingredients. Yeah, how many like, examples are out there like that? I, I mean, I would love to hear that because they're, yeah, I, I I mean, they're derived from, like, they always, science always looks to natural, um, whether it's from animals or plants or, you yep. know, something in nature that they can mimic. And then they recreate it in a lab and create the synthetic version. Like, I don't understand that argument in terms of like the synthetic being Better it's, in terms of we, like how they took out maybe some of the toxic. I mean, we always think more is better. It's yeah. like they concentrate is what they do. Yeah. You know? But then it's there's like, a delivery system that they're not accounting for. Too. Yeah. I mean, that's why I, I love the analogy. I'll never forget when I first read, I know I've shared it on here a bunch of times, but a long time we said it with the sugar analogy with the, you know, ban of the sugar cane. Yeah. yeah. All you the know, fiber you got like, to get. Sugar to actually would not be that bad to consume if you ate it in its natural form. Because you know how hard it would be to get the amount. I remember reading the amount of sugar that's in one Coke is like equivalent to six or eight feet of sugar cane. You know the amount of effort and work you would have to do to grind that up by hand or no chew thanks. that down to get to that much sugar? Yeah. Like you, it would literally, you burn off the calories that you would consume getting it. Like that's how safe and okay it would be to consume as much sugar as you want in its natural state. But we've found a way to process you, it down and refine it and concentrate it. And now it's- a, You know what's funny about this? This is how arrogant uh, humans are we are pretty good about this with animals. When you look at yeah. people that care for animals in zoos, even, or when they're in captivity, or even our, our own pets. Oh, everything's delicately balanced and managed. Right. Oh, you know, yeah. what is their natural habitat, right? Let's mimic this as yeah. best possible. What do yeah. they eat? Let's, let's really, if we can do it, if we can bring it as close to natural as possible, that's best. And everybody well, knows that, right? We don't when look it, at ourselves as animals. That's no. The problem. You know why? Because we the ship has sailed for us. We're so far totally. from yeah. that. We don't that, consider that we're animals. Like, like, yeah. So we don't want to look back. We're ready for space now. We don't want to look back at that and say that because when you really think about that, almost everything we do is obnoxious and beyond what of we course. Like our natural environment. Like walk through your house and literally think about Every, all yeah. everything that you use or have in there. Like there's nothing that's there's natural. there's little I don't like it being that hot. Dude, okay, I'm gonna <laughs> there's little signs all of this. There's little signs and hints of it though, right? Like like why do we put like plants inside our house. Oh, I know, right? Like, why do we, why do we put plants We're all over the place? Trying to bring it back in yeah. a little why do bit. We, why do we like things that make yeah. the sound of water? But without bugs. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I yeah. like to hear water. I, I don't want to be actually yeah. on a waterfall. Yeah, but yeah I, I pay $5,000 for my waterfall to run to my house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude. It's so funny. Yeah. Or like when people like, imagine like, a, imagine a dog owner right now, right? And they're, and they keep their dog like in a confined space for seven hours. And then they come home, they let the dog out and they don't let the dog go outside. And the dog starts acting weird. They don't think to themselves like, better put my dog on some medicine because my uh, dog's got ADD. Yeah. He's chewing up all my some shit. Some weird yeah. people do, but Pe yeah. Yeah, people will be like, oh, it's because you fuck your dog's locked yeah, up all day Yeah, he needs exercise. We he needs to be outside. And then we do our do the same thing to our kids. Like, yeah. why, am I, why is Timmy acting up in class? Yeah, yeah. He oh. must be something wrong yeah, with Timmy. The environment I either sucks. put him in front of a screen for four hours when he's home, and then I put him in a school where they sit him at a desk for six Dude, hours. Let's put, some, <laughs> let's put him on some medication so he can, he can, <laughs> yeah. he can operate in this... So I was talking with my God, we're funny it's like ridiculous. That, huh? I was That's talking funny. with my daughter about this because uh, she's got a she's there's a kid there's a friend that she has who's uh, getting tested for ADD. You know, do you guys know this by the way? ADD and ADHD. Now it's all ADD. It means Just the same all thing. ADD. Yeah, right I learned this by the way because my wife is very well versed in ADD. She was like rattling off all the current information, and I looked at her and I realized like. Did you learn about this because of me? Yeah. Are you she's studying like, me? <laughs> <laughs> she's like, yes, it helps me understand. It helps, you. Me, <laughs> helps me figure out. I'm like, you oh, out. really? I'm like, can you explain some of the ways, you know, that this is? And so she were talking with my daughter. She's like, well, sometimes your dad can seem like he's not paying attention. Or I'm like, does he care about me? Is he even listening to me? She's like, but then when I realized how his brain works, I realized like, no, I'm not taking it personal. I'm like, okay, well, I guess that's good and bad. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, so. She's all putting reminder notes and scientific studies. Dude, you know, just so, anyway, so uh, we were talking with her about it because she has a friend who's going through this testing. And I'm like, and we were trying to explain to her how unnatural the school setting is. I'm like, we're taking children who of the, the entire age range, right? When as, as From birth till you know, death, right? The age range that you probably are going to move or want to move the most is the ages that we make your ass sit down and look at someone talking and listen to them all day long. And then we'll let you out for a little bit and then come back inside, do the same thing. I'm like, it's so, it's also so unnatural to sit only with kids your own age. So here's something that I noticed uh -huh. when my two and a half year old plays with other two and a half year olds, they struggle. They'll fight for the same toy. Yeah, put him with a five or six year old. Watch how well he does. Put him with a five or six year old, or yep. put him with a little someone even younger than him. Yeah, they yeah. perfectly work together. Yeah, yeah. 
So I'm like, it's so, the environment's so unnatural. Yeah. So I told my daughter, I said, a lot of kids are going to struggle on that. It's like, in fact, it's surprising some kids are okay in yeah. that environment. And then our answer is to put them on like these crazy drugs that like make them act the way that they're supposed to. Well, I remember I never thought about it until I had Max, the thought of what like what we do with daycare. Like how crazy is that? Like it never dawned on me. That's, Just, that's, we, that's, that's, yeah. that's a natural thing we do in our society. It's very well accepted that this is the norm. Your kid gets to about a year, two years old. You have to go to work. You guys go back. And so you drop them off at this daycare where they love your kid and they take care of but imagine you just came into this world and you've you figured out who mom and dad barely have figured out who mom and dad are this is your safe place and then they just like hand you away to some strangers and think of like how, as a kid remember <laughs> yeah. like here's yeah. a, another way I, I thought about too is like that you don't realize is like your time time is so different the younger you are of course like remember when you were like you know eight or nine years old and like the summer was like so short and then like school year was so low. like yeah, you, yeah. it's so that your time, your, your, uh, that they've proven that yeah. Yeah. you perceive time uh, much faster as you age. Wait, yeah. yeah w facts. It's so different. Yeah. Right? If I told you in a year from now, you'd be like, Oh my God, it's only a year from now. Right. You tell that to a 10 year old. They're like, Oh, it's like a lifetime. Yeah. Uh, so imagine a kid who gets dropped off for six hours. That's like a, and they're only a year old. That's like a huge fraction of their, their, their time. And so they're going to even perceive that differently than you are with a strike, man, imagine like how many kids and then heaven forbid they have a traumatic experience where maybe they have diarrhea or the, or maybe the lady's not nice to them or they're not paying attention yeah. or another kid is like pushing them down. Like, Oh my God. Like <laughs> the, the, it's a na uh, <laughs> normal is not natural. That's we confuse the two. We're like, Oh, it's normal. Everybody does it. Okay, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's good or yeah. it's natural. No, there's data. And listen, parents listening right now, I get this. Like I do lots of, there's lots of things that I do that are not ideal because I have to. This is just, you know, daycare and stuff like that. It's one of them. School, you know, like some, you know, you know, sending your kid to traditional school. That's another one. It's just the way it is. We're never going to be perfect. Okay. So I totally understand. There's lots of data to show that taking your kid to daycare when they're little is traumatizing. Well, because that it teaches them that they have to break this bond. They have to. To, oh, oh, I got to deal with this other person. A lot of them learn how to disassociate, disconnect. It's harder for them to build. And if you think about what's natural, we grew up with all the people we knew right out the gates. Right yeah. out the gates, we know these people. Yeah. We know all these people. We're with them all the time's birth. And then when We're I'm still with- still tribal at the end of the day. Yeah. I mean, that's and that's your core unit tribe, you know? And then you spawn off from there, like, and you introduce, you know, like, they're the- it, it's just like this immersion of like all strangers and then figure it out, sink or swim. Yep. It's pretty rough. Well, I, and I think the point of bringing it up but is not to, to shame anyone, any parent by any means at all. It's the, yeah, I mean, to your become, kid goes a, to daycare. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. become aware of it, right? Is to be aware of it so that like that, that gets factored into our decisions. Like you're I'm a little more empathetic that way with, with the kid. Yeah. You, yeah. You're yeah. more patient with the kid. Maybe you take a little bit more, maybe you as a, a rushed parent, be a little more mindful of when you just drop them off, yeah. like the whole process of that going down and then the picking them up. Or maybe when there is an option where you don't have to take them there, you're like, you know what? I'm not going to, because I'd rather, I want to be with him as much as I possibly can. So it just gets factored in. You're just more aware of it. It doesn't mean that you, you can't, or you're, you're not doing what the best you can to survive. And because that, obviously that precedes that, right? Oh, yeah. If you had to go to work to give your kids food and give a, you know, keep them alive, that well, guess what? They're going to have to have some adversity, and they're going to yeah, go through that's, that. It's like not having a roof you know, over your, your basic head. Needs met. Yeah, not having a roof over your head is way worse than going to daycare. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so, dude. so, but and that's that's traumatizing. But that's the point worse. is to like not just because society has deemed it normal, you know, and okay, doesn't necessarily mean that it really is normal. Yep. It's not like we've just we've we've decided that that's going to be. But the reality of it's actually very unnatural. To do that. So because you are doing something that's unnatural and it's your child, maybe being mindful well, dude, that I think is important. Our entire field, the field that we work in, what we do on the podcast is try is really artificial ways of trying to keep people healthy in a crazy, uh, not natural world. Like yeah. think about this for a second. It's like a massive intervention. Think about how to... weird this is. This is so strange. If you really think about this in the context of like humanity, right? We schedule a time. <sighs> to go to a place to lift heavy things yeah. and put them back down. We've built nothing. Yep. We've hunted nothing. Yeah. It was not a necessity, yet we have to do it to offset how terribly unhealthy normal yeah. modern life is. We have to find the purpose within it too. 
It's yes. Like, it doesn't give you that immediate gratification of, I built this, you know, right away. No, no. Yeah. You have to develop a relationship around it and you have to create this framework around it so that you do it, con you know, on a consistent basis. But how weird, imagine if you it's, took it's someone. bizarre, actually, Imagine 100,000 years ago, right? Not even. 100 years ago. Yeah. Take someone from 100. Yeah, I've right. said that before. Take someone 100 years ago and show them the gym environment. They'd be like, what the <laughs> fuck are you doing? There's plenty of work to do yeah. out in the field right go now. go shovel outside. That's yeah. right. You have a barn to build right now. You have some animals to do. My grandfather it. said yeah. that to me. I'll I never know. forget. Yeah. I'll never forget my grandfather. It's true, man. He told me, he, he's like, why do you, he goes, you work out? He's like, I just worked. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I did. Yeah. Yeah. What the hell are you talking about? The out part. In fact, my, my Sicilian grandfather, because of the work he did, it was so hard, right? They were really poor. His context of how much weight something is was how many, um, how, <laughs> what is, what are those called? Those boxes, they're like uh, pallets or whatever. Uh, yeah. Like how many pallets of lemons? <laughs> like so, oh, that's six pallets of lemons. They're crates, that's right? heavy. Crates yeah. So I'll be like, he like uh, I'll tell you, my dad will be like, oh, you know, Sal could deadlift X amount of pounds. Sweet. My grandfather would be like, okay, that's, you know, how many, <laughs> yeah. how many pallets of lemons is that? You know? yeah, that's great, dude. <laughs> my dad's oh, yeah. like, it's probably like this big. He's oh, that's pretty good, mm. you know? Well, when I, when, I worked, uh, <laughs> when I worked at the ranch, um, it was funny because, like, really diet and exercise was, ne like, never a conversation for their family because the whole life revolved around. And, and farming is seven days a week. You don't yeah. get a day off. No, you don't get a vacation. You, you like, get up, what, especially like four in the morning? Yeah, especially a dairy farm that's yeah. happening twice. And your nutrition that, is, like, what you do. I mean, yeah. a lot of it's eggs, milk, and yes. stuff. Yes, so you, like, so you don't you even... Use it up there's no you, you eat whatever bacon you want, whatever eggs you want, whatever, and you drink however much milk you want. Like, there's no... And there's you're burning so much off, and, and you're doing laborious, heavy things all day that there's not even a thought that goes into like weight management or or oh I shouldn't eat this or I should eat that it's like you feel like feel like a treat and have ice cream that day who cares not a big deal because don't worry tomorrow you got plenty of work to do <laughs> actually in fact why don't you eat some more yeah it's you like, need energy for tomorrow it was actually really interesting to because that was actually right when I was getting interested in, in training and exercise and you know I, I was I was like I have these two worlds I live in. I, li I go back to the city with my friends and, and my normal life. And then I have this, yeah. you know, dairy farm life and that their, their life versus everybody else's is so different. You know, I mean, the, when you think about it, that's how most people's life was just 150 years ago. Oh, I, I, mean, love it. Crazy. I think it's so, I used to love, I still, it's, I still have such fond memories, memories of my dad taking me to work with him. <laughs> and then every once in a while, him and his workers would have fun and they would just compete with each other right? To see who was stronger or more fit. Mm -hmm. But it was always in the context of like the shit that they did. Yeah. Like, so it was always like who could lift the shovel. Yeah, that was every construction. Yeah. From the I furthest part of the handle with the brick totally. on it or, yeah. you know, shovel the most concrete in the yeah, shortest period of time. Or how many bags <laughs> of cement can you lift above your head yeah, yeah. or who could lift a long piece of wood by just putting it on their body? Like just, and it would create their own feats of strength. There None of it a, was like okay, how much weight it was. just or, reminded yeah. me of something. There used to be there used to be a, this was a, like a popular, you know, one of those things that just moves through our society even before social media. There was a popular prank that you used oh, to I do with doing. a concrete yes, bag. Yes, yes. And you would slice, you slice so it. So right? here's what it was. Everybody okay. did this. Yeah, I see. Did like, you guys do this? This is yeah. before social media. So what you do exactly is you, if you have a new guy on the staff or the team, right? Yeah. It's usually some young kid in their maybe te late teens, early 20s who chose this. He's like, I'm going to go in this career. They'd say, okay, how many, how, how many times can you lift uh, a bag of cement above your head. So what yeah. you do is you put it on your head. Yeah. Then you get a guy behind you to kind of watch your technique or form. Yeah. Then a guy in front of you is going to count. And what you do is you press it up and bring it down, but you have to hold it up. Yeah. So the You're guy gets an ready. Exacto knife. He presses it up. Yeah. A guy with a trowel or a exacto knife behind him cuts it in the middle. Poof, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right I've that was like that. a thing everybody right that was that. like a thing that everybody i think if you ever did construction i think everybody did it's that like to the, to the in, induction in yeah, the, yeah. Uh, isn't it wild how stuff like that like the, the nintendo thing you know yeah. we talked about that before where it's like just everybody blew in it like how did, how did you we know, know? yeah yeah there was no internet there was nobody sh sharing That's stuff so on the weird. internet back then it just spread yeah the, that or the atomic sit up we yeah. talked about that yeah yeah <laughs> nobody ever don't look that up oh everybody. my god i was talking to uh, uh i think it was like ethan and his friends about that like when we were they just couldn't driving. believe it right 
and and thankfully like one or two of them knew but like the other ones didn't know about it it was awkward describing it you know it almost sounded like i was like ew that sounds like like gross and kind of rapey i yes i told my kids about it and and you know as i'm telling it you start you know because there are mirrors right whoever you're talking to (laughs) if i tell you guys we laugh ha ha ha. i didn't realize how terrible it was yeah (laughs) i was telling my kids and i remember my, my my son must have been in eighth grade maybe at the time and he looks at me and he goes that's sexual assault. <laughs> and I'm like, oh yeah, I guess, I guess you're, you're right. right. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, it's terrible. <laughs> Thankfully I wasn't one of them holding them down. Yeah, you're like, what are we <laughs> doing? Like, I felt real bad. <laughs> what are we doing to each other? I don't it's know, so dude. dude. It was a joke. Huh? <laughs> yeah. You guys know uh, the theory behind that, right? Why, why, uh, why guys do shit like that to each other? There's a theory, right? Oh, what is it? Oh, you <laughs> find out who's the weak one. Yeah. So I was actually talking, in fact, yeah, you know, I was talking to my daughter about this because Jessica told her about the prank she played on me with the texting. Mm-hmm. And my daughter thought it was so funny. And I told her, I said, never start. I was having the whole conversation with my daughter. I said, don't ever do a prank war with a boy because boys escalate it. Wait, they don't know where to stop. It'll yeah. be really bad. So I was giving her examples. Somebody gets hurt with a guy. Always. It's just, <laughs> or something terrible. Like, okay, I scream, I made you jump and then you took a poop on my desk. Like, how does that yeah. a normal escalation? Like, yeah. that's, yeah. and that's something that boys- You, skip, you skipped a few <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like hella yeah, levels. Yeah. Like, it just gets crazy. <laughs> so, and then, so then it was like, well, why do, you know, boys do that? You know, why do guys do that? The theory is, is that guys are constantly, this is the theory, so who knows if it's true, but they're testing each other. Right, going to war. Huh? Yeah, because you want to see who, who will crack. Right. When the shit hits the fan, we're hunting, we're out in war. Like, you want to know, yeah. you know, who's going to yeah. crack and who's going to be able to, you know- Stand tall or whatever. I so, think that's funny. I know. I think I, this hilarious. is why it's like endearing. Like I don't know about you guys, but when I was younger, when I start to become more secure, if I hung out with a group of guys, and if they would do like they would play a prank on me or call me a nickname, mm-hmm. you could tell when they're doing it bullying or when they're joking. Mm-hmm. But when they were doing it, it was almost like, oh, cool, I'm accepted in the group now. I have a terrible nickname. Oh, to- yeah, hundred percent. It was that. the best. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. There's there's always the guy that, that has mean spirited behind. You can tell you can the tell. difference. Yeah. yeah, and it's and then and then you know what you're dealing with too. It's like, okay, this is the guy that's like just the the guy that wants to hurt people. You he know, he like always gets mean. ostracized, anyways. Right. Yeah. It's just like you he's, the one that can't, he's also the one that can't take it. You know, you, exactly. You, the like, most I mean, Jordan one. Peterson talks about this, right? Like you can't, you can't rule the group and be like this tyrant no. because eventually everybody will come and overthrow you. So it's like, even if you're going to be, you know, making fun of or poking and pot- prodding at each other, like if you do it in a mean spirited way, eventually you get overthrown. I've totally. been wrestling with this because this is kind of where Ethan's at. Cause he's a teenager, you know, and he's like going through this with his friends and like, they're, you know, the, uh, making fun of each other and this and that. And I'm like, in the kind of describing what we we're just talking about, whether or not who, if it's, you know, mean spirited or if it's, you know, semi funny and, and, uh, you know, and I've been kind of like stepping back myself. I've been like, dude, I've been like pretty, pretty like, like, like short fuse lately. Like just, and I'm like, what the fuck is going on with me? Like, and, and even the last podcast we you did, been, I, I you, felt a little like, Ugh. yeah, you have been a little, I didn't. And then I'm, and, and, and I honestly, and I, when I was delivering that, like story like i wasn't i wasn't chastising ethan or anything about like having like a hurt ankle or anything and i'm not like you know yeah. shaming him for that and that, but it felt like i was like a little hard you know mm-hmm. on on him for that and and then too like i've just been snappy and with courtney and i got into it you know last night and all this stuff I'm like dude like is it the lack of cheese? <laughs> like, I feel like and I he brought up. Actually, up. I am, I am actually, such like a, 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 an angry person. Now. He actually brought up a very interesting point, though. I believe that there there's something about cheese that actually uh, interacts with like the opiate, opiate receptors. Yeah, there is. But that's all. That's all, bro. And he food. takes enough of it in <laughs> that it's like maybe a small I'm dose like of a heroin withdrawal hey, or something. Maybe, dude. maybe his he's having heroin ch- withdrawal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe. Maybe yeah. his- but I mean, I, I talked to Sal a bit too. Like I've been more of the lack story. of sleep. Like with- <laughs> yeah, there it is, right <laughs> yeah, there. You know, so that that that's more likely. But I mean, <laughs> I, honestly, I'm still I'm still trying to make a I, case I for my lack of cheese. I, I tried to, to make some that drugs case. on him. You were like, well, maybe we should look at some other things. I'm like, yeah, bro, just take some of this. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I like Adam's advice. Hey, he's gonna put. Hey, he's gonna have cheese capsules. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You gotta weed yourself like, Dude, create them, bro. I got it for you. He's, tra- hey, he's trying right, to go. He's well, going I'll to the doctor. It. He's like, listen, doc, I, I stopped cheese, but uh, fuck, it's uh, but I'm doing I, heroin. I'm now. angry now. <laughs> yeah, so I probably should have it, right? Right? No, it's just a you, little heroin. It's because you've had crappy sleep for, for like weeks. I know, I know, I have. Yeah, it's crappy rough. sleep will make you. Yeah, and it it shows up listen. for me like, and it's not obvious because like, yeah, lack of sleep. Usually, you're like 
fatigue, you know, your brain fog, like, oh, uh, like it's, it's visible signs of like, I'm, I don't have energy, but for me, it like, I, ugh, I try to like bury, bury it. And then it becomes like this irritation that just comes out in weird places. Dude, and, I and have that. lived this for the last three years. My, my wife is a different person. Everybody is right. But she's bear the brunt of the lack of sleep with the, in the family because she's <laughs> with the kids. She's a completely different person with lack of sleep. Everyone, we, she's aware of it. I'm aware of it. It's this is anybody, right? When I get a lack of sleep, I also become very aware. I'm short. I'm more forgetful than normal. Uh, more likely to feel depressed or negative. It's terrible. Yeah. It's fucking terrible. And the problem is you can get away with kind of like a little bit of shitty sleep for a while. So you think you're okay. I'll just add the caffeine. Yeah. I'll do a little of this. I'll get that. Make myself like I can operate at work. I guess I'm fine. No, nah, man. Well, it's like, feel like it just makes you an asshole. It's too. It's like, I don't have an excuse. Like it's a random thing. It's like, kind of like it got thrown in the mix and I wasn't ready for it. And then it just it was like, ah, oh, it's, it's going to be temporary. And it's just kind of like, oh, it's not going to be like this for very much longer. And it just keeps extending itself. And, uh, it, the, the worst part for me is that like Courtney handles it like a champ and she's just very like level headed. Yeah. She's tired and like yawns and whatnot, but like, doesn't get like I get like, I, I just like, it just, it compiles slowly and then it gets worse. And then I just, I feel myself like just getting angry. And, Do like, you think crazy. that's because of her training? Maybe you're just an asshole. You think that <laughs> I have thought that there's only one, there's only one natural asshole. In the room. I, maybe Adam just gets the least sleep out of he all does, of us. He bro. doesn't even listen, admit it. Listen, uh, I'm going to tell you probably what this hundred percent, uh, bro. We always joke around moody, whatever you have the worst sleep consistently. Always, not always. It gets better and worse. But chronically, you I mean, tend I can't, to have, I can't argue with you right now because I'm. That's happening to me right now. But it happens well, on you its gotta own. Worry, I feel like you got to worry about more things. Too, it, it, but it just happens on its own more often. Is what yeah, I mean. Yeah, like yeah. you don't have interruptions as much as you just can't sleep. Yeah, yeah. For I mean, whatever I'm definitely, reason. I'm notorious for. Um, I don't know. I think Doug would be up there with me too. I think we. I think one of our curses True. is thinking about business at night. That is the worst. And it's like so. It's okay. It's such a hard. It's such a hard thing too because I also recognize uh, the strength in it. Right. Like that's when I'm by myself laying in bed at 10 yeah. o'clock at night, everybody else is asleep. I'm deep in my thought sure. and like numbers are flying through my head. Yeah. Thinking six months out is what like everything is coming together for me. And I like no, like it's the most. Now, you know, it's not a business thing though, right? You know that it's a natural behavior and you will pick the things that you're most into or concerned about. So for someone, it could be their kids, someone else, it could be fear about what's happening in the world. You obviously run the business. Um, you love it. So that's where your thoughts are going to go. But it's there's something else that's deeper as to why you can't let go of the world and then, you know, kind of fall into. Yeah, but my, my point of that is I don't know if I would want to. I don't know if I would want to sacrifice the, the letting go because like my point is some of the best work gets done mm -hmm. at that time. So it's like, oh, okay. Let's say I, you, you, you're where you're alluding is like you're some th deep rooted childhood thing that you uncover. Who knows? Who knows? Let's just say that. Let's yeah, play yeah. that game. Let's go right, down right. that. Like, got something that is related to that. We uncover it. I solve it. Now I have. I sleep like a baby. I'm out by nine o'clock, and then I don't think about the business ever again yeah. and from nine to midnight when some of my best work is done at that time. Yeah. So it's like. I, I don't know. Yeah, if, I don't know. I don't know. My sleep, let's put it this way. My sleep ain't that bad to where I would sacrifice sure, that right now. Maybe sure. if it was chronically like crippling me yeah. and I was like not able to. I wonder to. how used to it you are too. I mean, my 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 sleep score and on my aura and stuff like that, uh, other than this last it's couple of weeks. It's been better, yeah. Oh, I mean, it's, yeah. I, I've been good. I ever, since the, ever since the sleep eight, that thing is, I, I know today's not a commercial for them, but let me tell you, that thing has been yeah, I know. game changer. Yeah, yeah well, I think badass. healthy you is typically better you, but there is something to be said about uh, the innovative state of mind. Uh, innovative state of mind and inspiration often comes from uh, stress or outside the norm or whatever. So you'll see people who will innovate more when they're fasted or when they're going through stressful situations. So there is some truth to what you're saying, I think. Oh, I mean, I, if you were to open up my iPhone notes, which is where I keep most of my stuff, right? It's me reaching over at the middle of the night, you know, with my thing all dark and, right, right. you know, writing down my thought. I mean, yeah. it's crazy, bro. I mean, I have thousands and thousands of notes in there from 
you know, just being deep in thought. Yeah. And mm -hmm. yes, would it be what happens at night for me too? Is like real quick note, just have to put it down. Yes, and forget it. And, and I do mean, you write I, a thorough note, or do you just put like a word and then you're confusing it? <laughs> you like, I've made that mistake. Depends before. if I'm high like, or not. You're like ketchup. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What the fuck is ketchup? I've made no, the mistake of going like, oh, I'll just put a couple things so I don't get in even deeper in thought, and then that fucks me because then I'm like, fuck, what does that mean? I know that. <laughs> I know that Where's means the something really important. Hey, you know, it's a note to yourself. Yes. Oh, smart me was trying to tell me something. No, now dumb me. Hey, and I have absolutely. I've done that. that before where I try not to like write a lot. I'm like, I'm just gonna write a couple words that'll remind me. And then the next morning comes and like through after dreams and all this stuff, yeah. I'm like, oh fuck, I know this is important. I just can't Dude. connect it. Hey, speaking <laughs> yeah. of like deep rooted stuff, so I did another ketamine session. So I took a couple weeks off because of the move and all that stuff. So I did another session last night. That is remarkable. It is so remarkable. So last night, so yesterday, I did another session. And they're all they're all a little different, right? Sometimes you have these big breakthroughs while you're doing it, other times it's like afterwards or just changes your mindset. Uh, I talked about earlier how it, it dramatically improves neuroplasticity, so it allows you to kind of rewire patterns and stuff like that. Here's the weird thing that's happened to me uh, a few times with it. I will literally have a vivid memory that I forgot. Like, and I'll have the memory and be like, oh yeah. yeah. Now it's, 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 a, it's typically a memory that I, pr I think I wanted to forget. Right. Uh, so it's yeah. something like, I don't yeah. want to think about. So you kind of like block it out. Prune it off. Yeah. But I had a memory of when I was, I must have been three. Three? Three. No way. I, I want, and I, it's not that I forgot it. I remembered it. I just didn't want to think about it. I didn't think mm. about it. So I, vi You're I, re pulling stuff up from three. Yeah. It must have been because it was in the first house. Now, okay. How do you distinguish right now? The that age? it's a that it's no that it's a well no I know you can figure oh, out oh. age by the things your house this or that sure but how do you distinguish right now because one of the things my sister and I were talking about this uh, before about like memories of my dad right because oh you want she was six I was, memory or a well no like and one of the things that we uh, go like man I just I have so few memories of dad and what I what I can't even distinguish now is if that was a memory or that's something that's a story someone else told me about mm -hmm. a time or a, maybe a video you saw of that, like, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yes, so, yes. so how do you distinguish that's when you're influence. having these, that like, that's not like something that your parents told you. So, but, I, so this is a memory that I remembered for a long time when okay. I was a kid. And okay. I think I didn't want to think about it for a while, but it, it's very like clear. I remember the experience mm -hmm. is what I should say. Cause I was in it. I remember the experience of it, but I know what you're talking about. I've done that before where I'll tell a story to someone and then I'll be like, wait a minute. Yeah. Did I make up the story and then tell it so many times I think it's true? <laughs> you ever do that? I, oh, yeah. I remember telling the story, like, of uh, when I was young with my brother, and we, like, met this kid, and um, he he basically was, like, trying to be cool and show us his knife. And so he, like, pulls his knife out. And in my memory, I was so scared that because it was unexpected. He pulls it out like this, that my memory told me that like he pulled his knife out and was like trying to hurt us with it. And he was just trying to be cool and show mm. us the knife. And like my brother had to like tell me, no, this is how it actually went. And like, because I was younger than my brother, two years. And so it was just like stuff like that, yeah. like happened to me all the time. Though I had a story I made up where like I beat up these guys and I was like tough and I told my <laughs> friends forever. <laughs> I told, hey, I told kids forever <laughs> this story that it got to the point where I was like, you Classic, it. Dude. bro, because you tell it for so long. And then as an adult, I look back and I'm like, I made that shit up. I was never, never <laughs> happened. I was watching a Kung Fu movie. <laughs> that dude. never happened. I just said that to sound cool. Well, I've had ones where I'm telling a story about a memory I had of a Christmas when my dad was still alive of like, oh, what I, I got a desk and, you know, there was this bike and then he came in. And then, like, I'll watch all of a sudden. It, it's a video, and that, you remembered the video. And I and I'm like, oh god, did I just at nine or, or did that like at twelve? I watched that video, and so then it, so it actually happened, but you don't remember the full thing. That's right. I know. And and so is it? Was it actually? Am I actually remembering the that moment of being there, or am I remembering watching the video? That I saw. You get what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of stuff like that. Oh, that yeah. They, there's lots of studies on this. <laughs> there's lots of studies on this, and they'll show how you can implant things into memories and stuff like that. So, but this was interesting because I re so a, a, a couple things with the ketamine uh, therapy is that I'll remember something occasionally, and then I'll remember the experience, and then I'll realize that I that I either downplayed the experience or I thought of the experience as being something else than it was. 
so on and so forth. So like there was like loosely, there was an experience I had with my dad and I thought he was, he was ashamed of me, but the reality was he was frustrated because he didn't know how to connect with me. And I clearly saw it now looking back. That was interesting. But this is another interesting one where I remember I was sitting in a, in a high chair in our old house and my parents were just going at it. And the reason why I remembered this uh, in there was because I have this mode. You guys know this. I could, no matter what's happening in my life, I could turn off whatever's happening and just go into a different mode very easily, very easy for me. I learned how to do that as a kid because when you're little and your parents are, you know, whatever, going, you're fighting, yelling at each other. My parents were really young when they had me that I learned how to like shut it off. Yeah. Interesting. Not react, just like whatever, shut it off. Hmm. And it was such a learned um, strategy that it became my second nature so to the point where uh, I now have to learn how to access feelings. I can identify. Okay. So this, this is a, this brings up a really cool question then very, very similar to what I was just talking about with my sleep. When you go do the, when you talk to the therapist afterwards yeah. and you're working through this, how do you reconcile knowing that that's also been a superpower of yours? And so it's like, okay, I recognize work could also disconnect me from my partner or my kids and how I need to get better at sure. that and stuff like that. But then I also recognize that this, you're also the guy who I've watched have drama or traumatic stuff going on and then walk in and crush an interview. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like that superpower comes from that. So how do you reconcile that? Yeah, I don't think I'll lose that ability. <clears throat> I think, but I think I'm I'm aware of it now and uh, that it, here's the difference. There's a difference when it's operating on its own versus I know how to grab it and use it when I need it. There's a big difference. Okay, so this is, this now goes back to like how I used to use cannabis, right? Mm. So I'm very aware of like when I'm in deep in thought and I'm laying in bed and like, I want to be here. Because right. this is like, I'm having really good thoughts yeah. around like the vision of the business. And it's like, oh, this is going to play out like this. Oh, and, and like, I don't want to leave that space. Then I have other times, like last week was for me like this, where it's like, I've got this anxiety or angst or whatever excitement that got going on. And I, and I can't get out of my head. And I don't want to be in my head where this is where I would like take a couple right. hits. So now imagine if you knew mm -hmm. how. Numb it. Imagine <clears throat> if, you knew, if you had a better grasp of being able to go into something and come out of it and aware of, you know, how to do that. Like when it becomes your natural operating system, it's hard to turn off. Like for me, I can be in a stressful situation. Well, obviously the- And I can't, I, I don't show it. Like literally, yeah. I'll be in a stressful, and it doesn't show on my physical body. I can now identify what's happening. Like, oh, my mouth is dry. Oh, I feel this feeling. I get this weird feeling in my feet and my legs. Oh, I am- under stress or overwhelmed, or I am being bothered right now and it's not showing. Now, why is it important for me to identify this? Because let's say you're my partner, let's say you're my wife, and I'm telling her, hey, this is really bothering me right now. She hears my words. She doesn't believe me. She can't. She can't feel it. Like, you don't look like you're. When I tell her I'm stressed out, she's always, she doesn't believe me. Like, I know you're saying it, but it doesn't seem like it. Like, <laughs> you're out, you totally seem totally normal. I'm like, no, I am. She's like, yeah, I don't yeah. believe you. So it makes it hard to connect. It makes it hard to, and also, by the way, if you can, if, for me personally, if I can't grab on to or feel or allow myself to feel negative things, that means I'm also blunted on the good stuff. You only go as deep, like what do they say? A tree will only uh, grow as, as tall as its roots are deep. As wide. Or I don't know, one of those, something, right? like, that. Yeah, something yeah. like that, right? Yeah. So anyway, it was just really interesting. Now, does that mean it's all fixed or whatever? No, but I'm aware so now I can kind of go in and kind of try to rewire things. need to hug you before everybody No, goes. definitely no. not. Yeah. <laughs> I'm still not there. Good. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, interesting because I feel like you, you're you at the awareness phase, which I believe I'm very aware of yeah. what I just explained. The question would be, what does the, the, the practice look like? And obviously, I've used something to medicate that to get me out, yeah. of, the, out of those states. And really why, of course, I go back to, I told you the cannabis pulling off had more to do with my son than anything else. But then the, also the personal side of it is like, sure. well, I also got in the habit of like, I like it so much that it became more regular than it needed to be versus using it when I'm like, oh, well, here's a moment where so I So here's what's cool, right? So as I'm talking about these things and figuring these things out, I'm like, oh, it's an automatic process. Oh, it's not something I can control. It's my default. Here's what I love about what we do. What we do translates to everything. When you see somebody- with a movement pattern, a recruitment pattern that they've learned, the only way they could get, be, gain a new automatic re recruitment pattern is to first consciously train a new one. It's work. 
So you get someone whose shoulders roll forward when they row. Yeah, yeah. You can't just tell them, pull your shoulders back. You're going to do that. They're going to hike their shoulders. You know this. We've done so many times. So you have to put them in position. They have to train it, strengthen it, develop this new default pattern, and then eventually it becomes their automatic. But at first, they have to like practice Well, that's it, a, Okay, so you, it's the same thing. Now you're yeah, highlighting, thing. Now you're highlighting a really good point. Because, okay, here's, uh, here's the awareness plus the 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 new pattern that we've tried to create in when situations like this so when there's a time when <laughs> katrina claims that i'm thinking so loud it's keeping her awake right and say so she'll be like <laughs> I, I, I can't sleep i can hear you and i'm like mm -hmm. i'm not fucking moving how's that possible she's like i can literally <laughs> feel your thoughts like yeah. that's how weird as, this is how crazy this is right she'll she used to do this a lot we haven't done this in a long time but she used to like get up and box breathe with me and we would box totally. breathe together mm -hmm. totally to to calm me all the way down. Get the physical uh, part down so that your body's like, yes. oh, we can chill. Yes, yes. she's yes. probably picking up a lot of your body signals though, because she did a lot of body work with people, right? Yeah, I mean, she's not even touching me, bro. This is like as laying in bed. I mean, she can. She's she, hyper aware of the cues that you can't even consciously like. Yeah. like when you notice something's <clears throat> tense, but you can't put your finger on Some it. Some people just yeah, they have that. Yeah, she has that gift, right? Yeah. That's also one of her gifts. Very intuitive. Right? Yeah, she's always been. It's one of the things I've always been attracted to her is that that we. She has that right. I think it's the thing I like to think that we share mm -hmm. is this ability to be able to do that. What's wild is that she can do it on a level to be like eyes closed, mm -hmm. 10 o'clock at yeah, night. I've true. been laying there for an hour and nothing mm -hmm. has been said or movement. And then she'll out of nowhere be like, Stop it. Like, Leave me alone. <laughs> Dude, I need to say, I need to bring something. I need to change directions here because I need to bring this up. I, my position on a, a topic has become uh, a little bit more. It's a little, it's been strengthened and maybe a little more extreme. I think hmm. electrolyte supplementation is necessary for athletes. I don't think it's an option anymore. I think it's necessary. I've had enough experiences now with LMNT, with family members, friends, mm -hmm. their kids, <coughs> adults, people who do jujitsu, soccer, basketball, I whatever. Can back that up for sure. Every, Everything I've seen. Every single one of them, profound difference when they use electrolytes versus when they don't. So why no I change in diet student athletes, yeah. Yes. So why time. I find that really interesting, right, and hard to believe is the amount of sodium that is in the processed foods, which is 90% of most Americans' diets, you would think that they are getting an overwhelming amount of that even if you're an athlete. So what is it? Good question. So yeah. I don't think it's the over total all, excuse me, the, the overall, the other minerals, total sodium. I think it has more to do with the supplementing the electrolytes when they're being excreted and it allows for the balancing to happen faster. Mm -hmm. So they're not taking LMNT during the day and then tomorrow they go do their sport. Everybody I'm talking about, it's like right before, before and during. Got yeah. it. If yeah. you're going to sweat before and during. Got it. Every single because person. Because of the demand of that physical exertion. Bro, literally, the messages I'm getting. So, like, uh, I have a, a, a... Well, like, cramps, like, you know, headaches. So, my like buddy does jujitsu. He's a jujitsu. He's going to compete soon, right? And he's like, yeah. oh, here's the symptoms I'm suffering from. What do you think is happening? So, fatigue. You know, he's, he's like his muscles are, are, are not feeling good. He's not recovering fast enough. I said, here's something easy you could try. I said, stop by the studio. I'll give you a box of LMNT. Let me know what you think. He's like, what is that? I'm like, it's electrolytes, sodium, magnesium, potassium. Try it. Let me know what you think. Literally, the text I got. What's in that? That's what I got. I'm like, what do you mean? Did you like? I thought something happened. I'm like, he goes, bro. He goes, I took it for two days when I trained. I felt profoundly better, more stamina, more endurance. I was stronger. I just felt really good. Then I didn't take it. Felt crap again. Then I started taking it. I feel amazing. He goes, what's in that? There's got to be other stuff in there. I said, no. Literally, what I told you: sodium, potassium, and magnesium. And it's a it's a decent amount of sodium. Do you? Do you think there's something potentially there also with the magnesium? Of course. Considering that 60 plus percent of of the United States is deficient on magnesium. It's and not, you, I wouldn't use LMNT as a magnesium supplement, but it, you, you want to have some <clears throat> potassium magnesium to allow the sodium to do its job. That's what you want. So it's balanced in that sense, but it's not a magnesium supplement. If okay, so, magnesium, so, that, so does magnesium. that have to do with the, the transportation of it? Yep. It, yeah. Okay, well, and that makes, sodium works in the that body. makes a lot of sense yeah. then to me because y although the uh, the American diet is, is tons of processed food, tons of sodium, it probably doesn't have a, a perfect balance Correct. of sodium to magnesium. No. And so even though you're getting all of this fucking sodium- It's high in sodium and that's It's it. not the ideal mm -hmm. way to transport it into your body. You're now taking the most optimal way to do that right before you go into a session, even if you are- getting all this processed right. crap. And so that's why maybe everybody is feeling such yeah, a Yeah, the average American- Because it's obvious to me 
the the dieter, right? The health nut who is eating all whole foods. Like that's very obvious to me. Yeah, because sodium. Well, low. that's a substantial difference, right? Right. I mean, that's what we've felt and we've or low carb. But yeah, yeah. But it is. It, it, I have. I've seen the same thing with all the athletes I've worked with and have tried Element T. It's just like because of that demand and that that high exertion. Um, all levels of that, like it have improved when they use it. Yeah. It's so it's so for athletes, let's say it's an athlete who eats a normal diet. Okay. So their sodium intake isn't low. Like someone who eats whole, whole foods only or low carb where yeah. you actually need, it's not that their total sodium is deficient <sighs> and they need more. It's that when they're sweating their ass off playing their sport, yeah. it's the timing of it. You, your body will take some time to balance itself out. It'll take longer if you don't have the sodium readily available like you would with uh, an electrolyte <coughs> powder. So this he's drinking. So literally he's like, I told him drink half before drink the other half during mm -hmm. and he's it's night, night and day. And that's like the, I don't know, 10th person uh, that I know that's reported that. Yeah. And none of them are like eating like a perfect. No, I've diet. had nothing but positive stuff from everybody. I've given that out to, to people totally. a lot just because it's simply, you know, I, I thought you were going to say something about uh, the ketamine thing because did you, I, I feel like you should address the, the crazy long letter that we got from somebody that was so offended by you talking. What, that shit. it's expensive? No, that? no, not that one. Not that one. We got yeah, that one too. No, that like literally saying like, you're not talking about the potential harmful stuff and the fact that Sal's promoting ketamine on there. I thought it was really funny that we had somebody that- No, it's my personal experience. I know. You, this is the part that I think is hilarious about a platform like this. Like you can't, it's like you want- you want so bad to have a, a, a bunch of guys be as raw and honest and authentic as you possibly can, but then heaven forbid they share that they're going through something in their life that might have some controversy around it or uncertainty around it right. or scary for someone. Like, what the fuck? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's like you yeah. can't have both. Why would guy. you ever do that? Yeah. You can't have both. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you're no. not me. <laughs> you know? Yeah, no, 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 no. Potential harms. I mean, it's all. Uh, I'm doing this all supervised. Uh, this is not long term. You don't do it forever. Um, you know, ketamine has been around for a long time. That's why it was one of the first ones in the category to be approved for the use. Uh, but yeah, it's not natural. For and then sure. to, and I then wish, I mean, I would love to be able to do this naturally. Um, but yeah, I mean, it might take me years. It might take me five years, 10 years. I, I'm look, I don't suffer from treatment resistant depression or PTSD. So yeah, maybe I'm, maybe I'm doing me, you know, I have the luxury of, of, of doing this and it's cool and all. But if you have treatment resist resistant depression or PTSD, oftentimes nothing works. Yeah. Or you're gonna live for Your ten options years. Are very slim. Come on, it's it's about it's a quality of life thing. That's it. Which well, I also think addresses the other that other email that you were just saying is the one that you know, someone got all upset that's expensive. because because it was expensive. It's sure. Like, I don't think we've ever came on here and claimed to be the the cheapest anything. <laughs> like, <laughs> the thing. I think we've gone the opposite. Actually, is like yeah. I want the best of whatever just thing I can find, quality. and like if it's the most expensive, I'm sorry. You hey, know? look. I, if you look at the data, I, I'm, no affiliation. Okay, I'm not selling anything. There's no discount code or anything like that. But if you <laughs> If you look at the data on re, on depression treatments, the classic SSRI, whatever, and then you look at what they're doing with ketamine and how it's working for some of these people, the ketamine people will do treatment for a few months and then not take it for a year or two and then it'll stick around. SSRI, yeah, it's cheaper in the short term, but guess what? You stay on that shit forever. So do the math. You, you probably, if it works as advertised, you're saving money. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really don't give a shit what someone else thinks. I, I mean, know. as my friend, I would I would want to hear about it. You know what I'm saying? Like sure. If you're going yeah. through that process, I respect you as somebody sure. who's well-read, intelligent, doing your homework. It's not like you're out just experimenting with drugs all over the place. Know. You know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> looking for a good, yeah. no, you're looking for a good high or something yeah. like that. It's like, listen, you're trying to do deep therapy work on yourself. You've tried a lot of different things that you're having profound effects. I'm curious. Like yeah. I want to selfishly know. So fuck you. You know, yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, we have shout a, out. Yeah. Oh, is this to uh, Dr. Khan? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Hook up Dr. Khan. What a cool one, dude. Okay. And experience. What Brilliant. A great, yeah. What a great young scientist, doctor. Groundbreaking researcher. medicine he's doing. Yeah. Sure. He's doing reju Are reju we allowed to talk about who he's working I mean, with? Did he say we could say that? I don't know. They can wait for the episode for them to hear that, but uh, I he's definitely doing some big things. Yeah. What's his uh, What's his Instagram? Is it dr. A K H A N? Is that what that Correct. is? Correct. And he's blowing up right now. I know. Yep. I know. Really. Let me put it this way. We talked to him. Just find Just find him and follow him because we can't say much because we have an yeah. episode with him coming out. Genuine good dude. Too. Blew my mind. Like totally blew my mind. Some of the stuff that he said. Yeah. We all had dinner afterwards and it was just literally everybody taking turns, picking his brain. Mm -hmm. Dude is absolutely brilliant. And 
to funny funny side note, he's uh, at one point was ranked the number one Halo player <laughs> in the world for, on Xbox. Just a little icing there. Yeah, yeah. No. hilarious. I no, thought that was really funny. funny. That was around the time when I oh. was gaming. I dropped Did my gamer tag. Did your son recognize him? I took that picture. <laughs> he heard of him. I sent him the okay. picture. He didn't recognize him. Then okay. I told him his game name, and he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have heard of him. By the way, his gaming, I love how he talked about how being the world's best Halo player helps him with his treatments now. So the way he does treatments now, some of the therapy... He, the more accurate you can inject the needle and the closer you can get to the area that needs to be treated, the more effective you're going to be. So he's watching an MRI machine while yeah. he's moving a needle yeah. around. Get, and, and everybody's Competing like- Competing with himself every Everybody's time. like, yeah. nobody <laughs> has hands like this guy. And he's like, I learned it from playing Halo. That's so, <laughs> that's oh, so yeah, that's, Bro, that's like that uh, Gran Turismo movie. Did you guys watch that yet? No. It's actually really good. Uh, true Did story, you? right? Yeah. yeah. I haven't guys, seen it yet. Oh, it's it's worth the, it's worth the watch. It was okay. actually really entertaining. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, Katrina and I watched it just the other night. So good. You've probably heard us talk about peptide science and how it can affect the body. Well, there's a company called Intera Skincare that makes peptide creams and lotions for skin and some that go on your scalp that regrow hair. This stuff is legit. It really works. Like peptides are real. They have profound effects. You literally will see a difference, no joke, if you use their skincare stuff within two applications. That's what we all noticed. And then for the hair regrowth, this stuff is legit. It is not a pharmaceutical. It is not a drug that's going to have negative side effects. It literally improves health and blood flow to the scalp and allows your hair your hair to regrow or to grow thicker and faster. This stuff is legit. Check them out. Go to enteraskincare.com. That's E-N-T-E-R-A skincare.com forward slash M-P-M. And then use the code M-P-M for 10% off your order. All right, back to the show. First question is from Muhammad the One One. Does heavy deadlifting on a pole day grow forearms or biceps? Oh, controversial, controversial. Do deadlifts make your arms bigger? It's not a direct <laughs> arm exercise, but I let's. I said pole day. I yeah. was confused there for Yeah, a but let's talk about the 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 data. Right, the data shows that heavy isometrics recruit the most amount of muscle fibers. Heavy isometrics can build muscle and strength. Also, muscles uh, that are put under tension in a stretch position or elongated position, that is the, the best position for hypertrophy. Now, all ranges of motion build muscle, but lengthened in comparison to like mid-range or contracted is going to build the most amount of muscle. And there's also load, right? The, just, the, just the sheer load that the CNS has to manage sends a muscle building signal. So look at the deadlift. Crazy isometric tension in yeah. the biceps, and the forearms. In fact, if you've never deadlifted- Some of the most demand you're going to get. Totally. And if you've never deadlifted and you go deadlift heavy because you're relatively strong in your hips and legs and all that stuff, you'll find your biceps are sore the next day or your brachialis will be sore the next day. So heavy isometric, check. Is it a lengthened position? Your bicep is in a lengthened position, check. And then load. Find me an exercise you can load more than deadlift. So <clears throat> controversial, but I'll say, yeah, you could definitely, you will build. Well, and all the hypertrophy arms. nerds are going to argue because right. everything revolves around bicep curls, and that's the only right. way you can, uh, you know, build and develop your biceps. But you, the, I mean, there's there's plenty of studies out there for isometrics, just exactly the way you're describing it. And this is placing the most amount of load you can possibly place on your forearm and and bicep. Uh, with that in mind, if it being an isometric controlled. Uh, stabilized position that you're you're fixated in with those, but there's other ways to train them, and and all of it is beneficial. Thank so you. it's not just the one thing that we're talking about here. So uh, just that's you know for all the haters, I, I'm, you, we all are gonna go the same. It's so funny. I thought I was gonna be the only one to jump all over the, the idiots. So th I know this is gonna piss off all the science nerds. You went after hypertrophy bodybuilder doors. I'm gonna go after all the science nerds that only that live in a six to twelve week study bubble or only know how to tout studies they read versus like real world experience. My whole life I've been lifting and as a kid, like arms and forearms were like such a big deal to me. And I did every forearm magazine, superset workout exercise you could think of. The strongest and biggest my forearms ever got was when I wasn't giving two shits about them, but all I was doing was trying to catch Sal on the deadlift. Mm -hmm. yep. That was the biggest and strongest my forearms have ever, not even close to when I was cycling, like hitting them two to three times a week and doing all these cool exercises that I would reverse curls, everything. Nothing got them strong when I didn't even care about 
getting my forearm stronger or bigger, but I was so focused on getting strong at the deadlift, they came up that much. That's how impactful it's been for That's me. That's right. The, 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 what happens with the question like this is there's this false, uh, like this question is pretty direct. What they're not asking is, are deadlifts better than curls for the biceps, right? right? It's not an either or. No. It's a, hey, does heavy deadlifting have a hypertrophy effect on the forearms and biceps? Yes, yes, absolutely. Are they involved in stabilizing? Is there tremendous tension on those muscles? And then, like I said, with the bicep in particular, it's in a lengthened position. If I stop deadlifting, so I love deadlifting, but sometimes I'll go for a couple months without doing it and I'll work on <clears throat> correctional exercise or other things because I can deadlift pretty heavy even when I don't do it consistently and I'll get little nagging injuries and pains that'll pop up. And so now that I'm wiser and older, I'll be like, I'm going to back off on deadlifting for a while. I'm going to work on these where I notice these issues. And then I'll go back to deadlifting, see if I feel better. And I've done that now, you know, I don't know, five or six times over the last few years. Every time I go back to deadlifting, I'm still pretty, I can always pull five plates no matter what. So I'll go pull five plates. You know where I got sore? My, my biceps. I'll feel it at the, here at the insertion or my brachialis just from the tension of holding the bar. So yeah, it's definitely doing something, but it's not an either or, it's a plus or an and. The question is really, does deadlifting and doing arm exercises better than just doing arm exercise? The answer is yes. Yeah, I think the point though that I think is important, th this is how much my also training has changed. Again, arms were such a focus. When I was a kid, I used to just train arms. And if I ever you know fell off the wagon for a week or two, came back, what did I start with? Arms, right. you know, never missed arm day, but I missed leg day. I missed chest day. I miss all these other days all the time because I cared so much about building, building my arms. The way I train is completely different. I rarely ever train my arms. What I will go do is go do some pull-ups, go do some deadlifts. Like I'll do something like that because what I know is that's such, that movement is so beneficial for overall muscle on my body and your arms right? and I'm yeah. hitting my arms still. Mm -hmm. So it's like just my philosophy around training is, and I'm always looking like if I, if I'm only going to go in and do a few things in the past, that would be arms. I would do a whole arm workout for a half hour. If that was all I was to do would be, that would be the last thing on the totem pole. Now it's like, I'm going to go in and do deadlifting or pull-ups or these big movements that I get to develop my back and my forearms and my biceps all in one exercise. It just makes more Speaking sense. Speaking of which the other day I saw a dude working out jacked, well-developed, <laughs> and he was doing the, the, the pull down version that we talked about as a bicep pull down version, a compound lift. I saw him he had his wrist like this and he pulled down, but he had this kind of like rounded position because he was yeah, focusing on the bicep. On bicep. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, and he's very well developed. Obviously he knows what he's doing. It's not like he has bad pull down technique. And uh, then I went and saw him do other exercises for his biceps. I'm like, oh, he's doing pull downs for biceps. He gets it. That's I never, I never saw that before. Love that. Next question is from Jonathan Sosh. What certifications did you all start with as personal trainers? And did you feel like they helped prepare you to be a personal trainer? All right. This is again, another controversial answer. Mm. Um, the certification that actually had the most benefit for me in my career as a trainer was the correctional exercise courses that I took. There was this huge carryover into what I do with my clients and value that I brought them. Now, I'm going to be honest. I hate to say this, but... I don't know, most, if not all the certifications, aside from the ones I just talked about, didn't really do much for me in terms of my success or my client's success, except for making me feel a little bit more confident. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the value or success I got as a trainer came from learning through experience. And here's the second one. This is the big one. Learning from other better, more experienced trainers and coaches. Yeah. Like the certifications didn't do much for me, except for the correctional exercise ones. They were kind of a waste of time. I needed to get them or I'd get paid more for getting them or I'd have trainers go through them. So I'd want to go through them, but I didn't learn a whole lot uh, from them that I could apply that would brought value to people. Yeah. I have a pretty similar experience with that. I mean, I, I liked NASM as a good baseline, but it really was just touching up on anatomy, physiology terms and, and biomechanics on a very surface level. Uh, which is, you know, I went to college and studied all that. So it was just like, oh, cool. Nice little refresher to kind of get me in the mindset of how to like communicate this now to an average person. Um, but in terms of like beyond that, 
uh, for me, it was always like picking the brains of qualified trainers and what they were doing with their clients. And then sometimes I would go, really, it was like the, uh, the unconventional, the, the ones I had to go in person to go through the actual mechanics, like kettlebell training. And, um, like when I, when I learned, um, Indian clubs and, uh, different types of like tools that you physically need to be able to to, to go through the right patterns and get taught. And uh, that way it was easier for me to then incorporate it and program it in and show clients and have confidence on how to kind of like, you know, take them through those movements. It's like, but for me, it was all about like taking bits and pieces of a lot of concepts and modalities out there, which is, I could get a lot of that from communicating with really good trainers totally. and watching them apply it to their clients. You know, I, 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 as much as I actually shit on the formal education stuff, I actually got quite a bit of stuff. I went through eight different national certifications during my entire career. I probably don't, I don't even know if I could list all of them, but I do know there was there's some that stand out to me that I think taught me different things. Um, IFPA was my first one. That was pretty much a joke, but it got me introduced. Uh, NASM, I think, was one of the most well-rounded first, taught me the squat assessment really well. Uh, corrective exercise specialist, hands down. I agree. I think we would all probably put that up as probably yeah, one of the one. best. Uh, and I didn't. I never took Ken Stretch or um, uh, what, what is Kelly Starrett? Did he do one? I can't remember. Or his uh, supple leopard stuff. Yeah. Like I didn't do, get that till way the later. I would probably push somebody in Ken Stretch and supple leopard direction totally. now. Uh, yeah. Even for the, instead of corrective exercise, but corrective exercise specialist was what was around when we got in there. The sports performance specialist uh, that I got through NASM, I thought that was really valuable because that introduced me to sports training. Uh, Nesta was the first certification that really opened my eyes to like, oh, wow, there's some really conflicting uh, views on it. They were the first ones that d discussed deeper uh, squats like ask to grass squats mm -hmm. and, and for a national certification, that was really weird. And it really kind of shattered my paradigm because I came out of the already getting all these NASM. Let me, you know, let me comment on that real quick. Sorry to cut you off. It's what's funny about what you're just talking about. It was, it, it taught you a lot because it countered the other shit you learned from other certifications. Yes. Had you just through yeah. experience and <laughs> through training with other coaches who experienced, you would have learned that yeah. right out the gates. Yeah. It was more groundbreaking because yeah. it countered the shit that you thought so was I true. So I cherry-picked a lot of it. Yeah. Well, and I started to... So th part of the, the best benefits from having all these certifications was starting to see that. Yeah. There was sure. differences in philosophy with like NSCA on their nutritional component versus like an ACE or an AFA. Like, so I, I, got, to, I got to experience so many that it opened my eyes up more of like, oh, sure. th this isn't just the, the tr so part of like when you hear me talk about stuff like education, the reason why I kind of rag on it is because, you know, show me a certification that says this, I'll show you another one that says the opposite because they have, there's mm -hmm. so many like gray areas when you get into biomechanics and nutrition on some things. And so I did get a lot of value from having all those different certifications. Hands down, the best uh, corrective exercise specialist, Second probably was even the foundational NSM for having the squat assessment. Um, I, I really attribute a lot to the Nesta to opening my eyes about a, a deeper squat. Some sort of like mobility training like Ken Stretch, I think would be a, a massive one to have, even though I didn't go through the formal. Uh, Eldo would be valuable too. That's sure. heavy and deep. It's But, but I mean to, to set yourself aside and, yeah. and be able to get traction and with your spine. I think I mean, th there's stuff out there. I think there's a lot of value, but again, to me, it was like more of like, I'm going to extract what I can actually apply to my clients and have, cause I, I get the whole, like they have to like lay out the whole philosophy, the, the modality, they, there's the education of the why uh, behind all these concepts. And I think that, you know, you get a lot from that, but in terms of application of it, there's few certifications out there that do a good job with it. And I think, you know, like your Joe DeFranco's, um, oh, th yeah. theirs is a, is a fantastic, um, and, and, and to NCI and, and, you know, just more of these, um, these heavily focused on the application of like, now take this, apply it to your client. Here's how you're going to program it. And, yep. and this is where it's actually going to like, you know, you're going to re-benefit from it. Yeah. Look, here, okay. Here's the deal. We all trained trainers. And they were successful, not because of the training knowledge and no, techniques that we not. taught them, but because we taught them the culture, the proper culture, the proper philosophy of what makes a successful trainer. There's a way of being and a way of approaching health and fitness 
that makes you successful. Now you need to have knowledge. So I, I, this, this, the, the whole debate around not, you know, education and knowledge, like I feel like that's, that's a given. Like, yeah, you got to know stuff. If you don't know stuff, that's step one. Like you got to know stuff. But really what makes you successful is do you walk this path in this way that makes you successful and effective in a real true way? And the only way I learned that through being around other successful trainers and coaches, not by them teaching me, but by me watching them, listening to them, watching their actions, how they composed themselves, how they lived, the way that they said certain things that I knew to be true, but it was the way that they said it, <clears throat> the way they approached it that was so damn effective. It was literally like, it's this culture that when you meet successful coaches and trainers, you could take 10 around the world who are successful as defined by they've built a big, a good business and their clients achieve forever success. They actually really modify, help clients modify behaviors that last forever. You take 10 from around the world, put them in a room, have them train clients. There's gonna be a lot of differences, but oh, one yeah. thing is going to stay the same. They're all going to have this similar approach in philosophy and culture around how they operate. That nobody teaches. Nobody teaches. There's no certification well, that teaches that, unfortunately. There's, there's a reason we're building what we're building right now, right? We we have we have had the opportunity to Spoiler go Spoiler alert. Well, I mean, come on. it's 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 been well overdue, <laughs> and I think it needs to be addressed. And we 100%, this is the thought process. For every, and to your point, for every uh, trainer that you have that has a you know four-year degree plus eight national certifications, uh, I'll show you the kid who's 19 years old, has no national cert or one basic certification, and his business is thriving compared to that one. Yep. So Because he understands what I just said. That's right. Yeah. Just because you have a ton of that. Now, if you can take... What is it about that kid who has this thriving business and has minimal knowledge in the space and he's thriving and he's whooping the guy who's got eight certifications and a degree, you could take what he's do his, his ability to communicate so effectively and blend it with that person's knowledge. Look the fuck oh, out. Oh yeah, now you're yeah. talking about now world you're, class. That's right. That's now, world class. Now you're talking about a world-class trainer right there. Now you're talking about when you throw names around like a Joe DeFranco and stuff like right. that. Somebody who has the knowledge to go round for round with some of the smartest people in the space, but then communicate it to the simplest Apply of minds. It, understand and, how that's right. And make it effective yep. and implement it. And so you know, quite frankly, this is where national certifications miss the mark. They do such a good job of going deep on anatomy, physiology, yeah, they nutrition. They teach you the theory of everything. That's right. And they, and, they, and they give you the science behind everything, but it is not the most important Listen, part. Here's the bottom line. A, a physicist can explain the physics of a race car exceptionally well. What makes it fast? What makes it turn well? That's right, but can he race What it? makes it rev? But he ain't gonna, he's not going to be a race car driver. In a race. Who's been driving his whole life. That's it. Turn yeah. a That's it. You want to be an effective trainer, you got to be the race car driver, not the physicist. That's a fact. Now you combine the two, you got, like you said, yeah, world class. Next question is from Josh J 93 What MAPS programs are you guys currently following? Oh, I love this. Ooh. You know what I always, so I, I'll go through, general generally follow loosely the programs that we put together. And I say loosely because I obviously individualize them because I know myself and all that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. But I always bounce back to the original full body MAPS anabolic style training. And I move outside of it. Like right now I'm doing a lot of lateral training and some more correctional work. But then when I feel like I'm good, I go back to that old three day a week, full body, days in between, maybe some trigger sessions, maybe some mobility stuff. It just it's always the best place for me in terms of progress. I always feel the best. I feel the strongest and I can go outside of it to push my body harder, add more volume, do different things. It's That's all your good. homeostasis. But I get back yeah. in there and I'm like, this is where I think is, we all have that, me. right? Yeah. yeah. We sort of have our preferences. Like I, I tend to fall back into more functional and, you know, more maps performance type training. But I, I mean, I, flirt around with like your MAPS anabolic and, and MAPS power lift. And you know what I was doing a lot beforehand was the old time strength yeah. and was like really getting into that. And then was realizing, oh my God, like I ran the other day and was like, man, I am winded. And so all I've been doing the last like month and a half has been cardio. And so if you want to pick any of ours, it's literally um, modeled after a lot of what we put in MAPS cardio with the um, pushing the sled around and, and getting after it and get lighter on my feet and working a lot more on my forefoot. And so uh, conditioning is a big one for me right now. So I, I want to point out something that, because we get this question every now and then, you, you, you both, you know, like, similar, modeled after, 
it's important that the, the, the person who's asking this question and the people that tend to ask this question, you understand that the ultimate place to get is that you have such a deep understanding and knowledge of programming as I'd like to think that the three of us have. Well, we're creating them. Yeah, right. So I, <laughs> I hope we feel. Yeah. <laughs> and this is my point. That's why I thought, I, sometimes this question's a little funny to me, right? It's yeah. like, uh, I like to think that everybody in here is a black belt on program design that you don't have to follow this rigid structure every single day that you show up to work right. out. You understand the core principles of every single thing that we've we've written and where to apply them, when to apply them based off of how you feel, what you're thinking, what your goals are at that moment. And that could ebb and flow based off of where you're currently at in your life. Yeah. What you're saying is this is why it's so important because people also say, well, what do you eat? Okay. Yeah. What I do for myself probably has zero that's right application for you now if you're doing it out of curiosity that's totally fine mm -hmm. okay but if you're listening to it and being like i'm gonna follow that because that's what they do it's like zero application that, i know and i know it's in our best interest to say things like i'm following this to the t you yeah. know so like so i'm selling our program all the time but the reality is like that's not, not how just like i don't follow a rigid diet all the time does and it also means I would never teach my client to do exactly what I'm doing. I don't expect yeah. them. I to, just wear the t-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> I don't expect them to be, but that's our goal of this podcast and writing all these programs is to, to be able to give that to all of you is for you to be able to experience these programs, to listen to the show, to be able to get in and to where you like understand at that level that you don't have to follow one of, as, as bad as that sounds for our business. So you don't have to follow one of our programs, yeah. but you've under, you understand it at that level that you know how to ebb and flow that. Now there's a lot of cocky, arrogant people that think they know at that level that probably should follow it to a T until they get that understanding of like how to model it around their life. But I mean, the only times I really follow our programs too is when we create them, there's a- To test them out. To yeah. test them out. Yeah. Yeah. I, then I want to run through phases it's new, and be it's like- exciting. Yeah, yeah, and be like, hey, and give feedback to the guys. Like, you know, that was a little much. You know, we probably shouldn't have added that with that. <laughs> I felt this going on. And like, so we'll make little adjustments like that. And that's part of, that's why the process of building a program for us is a big process. It's not simply like, hey, let's throw a bunch of exercise together and call it MAPS Performance and we'll throw some cardio shit in there. It's not like that. It's like, there's a lot of thought that goes into it and testing, but as far as like following a rigid program, I don't know. I think Doug is the only one that does that. Yeah, yeah. Doug, well, he's I'm also, not a black belt. Yeah, he's the okay. least experienced, although although you're gonna be there soon. I would give you another- well, What are you running right now, Doug? Uh, MAPS 15 minutes advanced. So okay. I'm in phase three right now and I'm actually loving the program. So I've gone through anabolic probably 20 plus times. That's the one you always bounce back to. I always ba bounce back to that. So I usually do programs in between, whether it's aesthetic or strong or, you know, what uh, symmetry, some of the ones I've done recently. But I always go back to anabolic. But after this last round of working out, I was feeling it in my body. I was feeling a little bit tired. So I thought, well, MAPS 15 minutes would be perfect for me. So this is what I look like the most. If I were to say, because you guys all gave things that you're close. Yeah. Maps 15 is how I'm training most Adam's like. Adam's Maps 5 right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you why I love Maps 15 Coming minutes advanced. <laughs> Three minute abs. It's annoying because you, you look like you're doing Maps 45. <laughs> Maps 5. All that, all that uh, muscle memory or whatever the hell it is. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's most likely. Like, possible Maps 15. I really love I mean, change. I tell you what. Um, since you went that way, Doug, like uh, I have really, really enjoyed map 15 actually is probably the least like anything I would have trained most of my life. And I find that I get far more benefits than I would have expected. It's from surprising. It. It's very surprising. It's super surprising. It's very surprising. I got stronger. Following. And I really, I really enjoy the freedom of training in, in such either. And I, what I do is I go, sometimes it's a 15 minute workout. Sometimes I combine two 15s to a 30. So, so okay. I kind of, yeah. That's what it looks like. So if I have a three day a week where I only train three days a week, I've probably combined some of the 15 awesome. minutes to a 30 yeah, minute. Yeah. If I stretch it out for six days, I've broken it up in 15 minutes. So I'm doing the advanced, which is about 20 minutes to work out. I love that. I mean, it's in and out real and you quick. Feel good. You feel good. And I realized I was maybe overdoing it a little bit yeah. after, you know, so many months of following all the programs and pulling back. I feel great. I feel like, you know, I was... I kind of grew up with the more is better mentality yeah. and realizing that maybe less is better for me at this totally. stage. Oh, you know, one last point to make, because I just want to drill this home because we do get this so much is now, if I were to say, I'm going to go compete 
or I'm going to go like I have, I'm like very serious. Like I, I've got to build a bunch of muscle. I like, I probably would default to like following one of yes. our programs. So I have a structure to measure, to track, to get like, yeah. they, but then you would still exactly modify. I use yeah. It. I still yeah. would, I'd, As you went but I would be way more like I'm following totally. this because totally. it's that important. Like, it's just not that important to me right now. Like I really don't, care if you know 0.3 percent less muscle got built this week or uh you know i didn't i, don't, I didn't lose enough no. it's like i'm not there in my life i'm in a place in my life where i want to be healthy i want to be fit strong i want to be mobile but i don't need to be the fittest the strongest the most mobile just those are good I'm, life you want to have yeah i want quality. balance yeah. you know what i'm saying and i want to spend the least amount of time working out as i can to, to maintain all those things totally. right so yeah you know you said something i think you just put it out there like literally our goal with the maps programs is to eventually have people not follow any programs and be able to train themselves. Yes. Yeah. So our goal is literally to- You are at one work. with your fitness. Yeah. To create customers that are no longer customers. But I've tried, I've tried to do that though. <laughs> uh, me, I've tried to do it. I've yeah. tried to go off on my own do my own thing. It lasts for maybe two weeks. It takes a while. Yeah. Well, well, no, the, that's the, the, just good self-awareness. Some no, people aren't going to be that way. No, yeah. it's two weeks and then I say, I need structure. Oh, I and see. so I go back. I, I do well with the structure. There's nothing. And see, yeah. that's too, that's so important. I mean, people are asking us. So I think we are not like that. Where may, Doug may follow programs for the rest of his life. Probably he, will. He's not like yeah. that. Because maybe you look at it as like, I want to outsource that thinking. I, I reckon I respect the guys so much. Yes, I could do it myself. But why? When I have these three dudes that have put together something so good, I can outsource that thought process. There's nothing wrong with that also. But no. when we get asked that question, I think it's funny because it's like, it's, not like that for me. Yeah. It's I love we experiment and conjure. Yes, all the time I love it. It's easy. Yeah. It's a little bit it is always kind of experimenting and doing different things. Like it's mm -hmm. our passion. And so I don't want to outsource that. In fact, I'm very greedy about it. I want to always be adjusting it, customizing totally. it to, to my yeah. needs. And I'm not going to follow something. I'm rigid. like constantly iterating things yes. to see if I can improve any kind of level. So next question is from Fulvio. Castle, is the seed oil controversy real? Yeah, well, we kind of touched on this earlier. I'm going to read to you guys. So Lane did a tweet uh, that I commented on. This was uh, a few weeks ago. And In agreeance or disagreeance? Well, I mean, so I, here's what I like about Lane. Obviously, he's a, he's a scientist, uh, but he's also got tons of integrity. And uh, if he's not he, dogmatic. No, he, he, he can be dogmatic about things that are true, objectively, um, and argue his point, but he'll change his mind, right? So- he did a post and it says, if you don't want to eat seed oils, cool. But the mental gymnastics on some of you people is Olympic level. I wish the data said seed oils were bad. Then I could jump on the bandwagon and have everyone applaud me. But that's not what the data says. And he says, F your feelings, right? Classic lane, right? He's <laughs> very likable for a lot of people. <laughs> I love it. So now my comment underneath his post was, my issue with seed oils or any other food that requires industrial level processing to access is that we could be eating something in quantities that our bodies never evolved alongside with. This could mean nothing, but so far it usually means not ideal. That really summarizes my view around them. What's funny about this, by the way, what was is there, Lane's response? There, he didn't, he didn't respond to it, oh. but there was a scientist underneath it. This other guy, this is the shit that I hate right here. And Lane would not say this to me. But this guy says it, and he goes, yep, that means nothing. If it meant something, the data would show it. Oh, God. My response, <laughs> my response to him is, that's arrogant and ignorant at the same time. Have we ever run into a situation where data showed no harm, and, data, and then data showed clear harm? Like, what? And then I'm sure he went crickets after that. Just It's just, no, and then he tried to backtrack. It's so annoying to me. Like, uh, do, we, do we need more examples of times we thought one thing because the data showed something, then we learned something yeah. later on? We don't. Now- my opinion on seed oils is err on the side of caution if you have the option and the choices. That's all. Because like I said, uh, seed oils, the quantity that we consume them was never possible without industrial processing. We never co-evolved with this level of consumption of oils that are not like other oils that we, we consume in larger quantities. And usually that means that there's downstream effects that aren't great yeah. usually not always unforeseen consequences now by the way someone someone's going to make the case and argument well that's almost everything in our life so I, well that's why you should proceed with caution Correct. with almost <laughs> exactly. everything that's true we didn't evolve with fucking big giant tvs that we stood five feet from staring at for hours you're all actually day long. responsible for hey, your own health maybe think about that yeah. might not be the best idea yeah. you Even know it says it's it's take it's, your brain and outsource it's it legal and it's okay and we have nothing that shows that it's going to do any major brain damage okay but we didn't we didn't 
grow or we didn't exist with that just 50 years ago. So maybe consider doing that. And then, oh, by the way, now we've made, we've downsized it in this little handheld thing. We can give it to our two-year-olds to watch. Like maybe think about that. So it's like, here, I'll take it a step further. Uh, we didn't evolve knowing the news of the world. Okay. We evolved knowing the news of our tribe, meaning we're attracted to negative news because it kept us to survive. And we needed to know because if John, who got eaten lives a, in the cave with got me, eaten by a mountain lion, says, "Hey, oh <laughs> shit, I saw some stuff down there," like you're gonna want to listen. Yeah. Now I can go on my phone and learn about every kidnapping and every murder and every rape yeah. and every crazy thing around the world. We didn't evolve with that kind of knowledge. What does that produce? Tremendous anxiety. It's a fact. Stop watching the news. Watch your anxiety drop. It's that's all it is. Now, does it mean it's bad to know things? No, not necessarily. But you should be aware. That's true for everything. So, seed oils, yeah, dude, like. Go re, look at the process that is required. Doug, maybe you could pull up the process of creating like rapeseed oil. Okay. Great name, by the way. I should, I think yeah. they, I think they, they call it branded. canola now. Now it's canola oil. Yeah. It's yeah. called rapeseed oil. Yeah. By the way. Uh, that uh, had me concerned. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'm still calling my shirt a white. A little less consumption. From now, why, you know, the part that's interesting too, too, why Doug pulls us up, Sal, is there's so many replacements to that. So why is it such a big deal? I know you can cook canola at a much higher temperature. So for deep frying, it's it's better than like which which we shouldn't be doing with most of our foods. Anyway. Yeah. Well, not necessarily deep fry with lard or something like that. Or well, okay, here's why: because it's cheap, it's massively produced, and it's inexpensive. Try to replace it; you're going to pay a lot more money. That's all. It's also very. It also has a long shelf life when you produce things with it. It's it's very uh, convenient. But look, look how it's produced. It's extracted by heating the crushed canola seeds, which by the way, how much oil do you think is in a seed of, of a, a, a canola seed? Yeah. Like they have to do a lot of them to do this, which you would never consume that many anyway, right? But you have to crush them. Then you dissolve them in a hexane solvent. Then it's refined using precipitation and acid to remove gums and free fatty acids, filtering them. And then they'd use deodorize. Then they have to deodorize it so that it doesn't smell or have a flavor. So it's like this flavorless, uh, odorless oil. Like that's a lot of shit that we can only do now because of technology. They weren't able to do that a hundred years ago, a thousand years ago or, or beyond. So just proceed with caution. I, if I had to bet money that they're going to show that it's worse for you than other easily accessible oils, I'd bet money on that. And, and I'd probably win. Not a guarantee, but I'd probably win. That's all. That's yeah. my whole position with it. So if you have the choice, I would go with something else. But do I think that it's as important as like eating the right amount of calories, eating high protein, getting good sleep, sticking to whole natural foods, drinking adequate water? Yeah. Like, no, I don't. I don't think there's, there's bigger movers out there. I mean, I think there's a, this reminds me. Did we? I don't know if we talked about it at the time where um, our we had two friends. Josh Trent and Max Lugavir, and then, or three, if you include uh, Check. Paul Check did a video oh, yeah. about Max Lugavir driving through McDonald's, and then Eating Josh the Trent came after him, and then they tried to loop us in to pile on Max. And, you know, one of the reasons why I think we love Max is that we, we share a similar type of position around things like this, right? Like, hey, th th this is probably not ideal, so I'm not telling everybody they should comprise their whole diet of going through McDonald's drive through and eating burgers. But in a pinch, and if, with people that say you don't have enough money and, you need, and you're lacking protein and here's a source, like this is a possible way to do it. Yet at the same time, I'm saying this is not ideal. And then you have the people that love to like do the fear mongering on the other side that's yeah. just like, yeah. oh my God, this is like the worst thing. And it's like, there's, there's a balance there, I yeah. feel like. And I think there's people that like do the a, Puritans. Of, I think there's a uh, good. Nutrition. I think there's people that do a good job of communicating. I think Max is one of those examples well, of we, somebody who talks about. We those could things. create all kinds of fear around seed oils, and then the average person who doesn't do anything else is like, "Oh, it's the seed oils. I'm going to go and overeat a bunch of other shit. Oh, this has no seed oils in it, but it's like candy, right? There's no seed oils in candy, but there's but they're or whatever. That's those. That's an extreme example, but that's what ends up happening when you place too much value on one thing and you miss the big rocks. You miss the big things that are big movers, which is like start by eating high protein diet, eat whole natural foods for the most part, lift weights or do some strength training here and there, get some good sleep. Like that's 90% of your health right there. Maybe 95%. Then uh, the rest, you know, you could look at all the little moving parts and seed oils and, you know, if something has preservatives in it and, and stuff like that, or protein powder versus actual, you know, food, that kind of stuff. So look, if you love the show, head over to mindpumpfree.com. 
and check out all of our free fitness guides. We have a fitness guide for almost everybody, and again, they're free. You can also find all of us on Instagram. Justin is at Mind Pump Justin. I'm at Mind Pump DeStefano, and Adam is at Mind Pump Adam. 